Every day that we move closer to opening day, Jackson Holiday gives us something else to make us say, this guy needs to be on the opening day roster. And of course, he did it again on Tuesday. And we'll break it all down coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Wednesday, March 20th, 2024, and welcome back into the Locked on Orioles podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, we're going to take a look back at the Orioles spring training win from Tuesday. We got a broadcast, we got stat cast, we got 13 runs scored by the Orioles. We're going to break down everything you need to know from that one, including Cole Irvin looking a little shaky and Jackson Holiday continuing to impress. Then we'll chat a bit about Jordan Westberg, who should be fine, but did leave Tuesday's game. And we'll chat about, okay, if the Orioles did lose an infielder to injury like Jordan Westberg, what would the roster look like then? And what would they do? And finally, some other Orioles news and notes to go at the end of the show. But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast, which is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. So let's dive into what happened on Tuesday. Orioles were off on Monday, no spring training game, but back in action Tuesday. And actually, the start of a nice little three-day stretch here, and the, the second to last, I guess you could, really, I guess you would say last week here, of spring training, three televised games in a row, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday this week. Only time it happens, all of spring training. And Tuesday was a treat, because not only did we get it televised, but it was on Masson, although they just ripped the Sportsnet Blue Jays feed and put their own audio of Kevin Brown and Ben McDonald over it. Not quite sure still why they just can't do that for the other games that are televised. But either way, we also we also got the StatCast numbers from this game in Dunedin as well. And that is the whammy you're always looking for in spring training. And the Orioles, they're going to put on a show, won the game 13-8 to over the Blue Jays on Tuesday. And I'm going to get you the five things you need to know from that Orioles spring training win on Tuesday afternoon. The first thing you need to know is, I'm ready to call it, Jackson Holiday is ready for the major leagues. It's been a great spring for him so far, but it's not just about the good stats and the OPS over 900. It is about how he looks out there. He looks comfortable at the plate against big league pitchers. He looks comfortable defensively at second base. And yeah, maybe there's some more steps for him to take at shortstop, but he's not going to really need to play shortstop right now on this big league team. They've got Gunnar Henderson. They've got Jorge Mateo. Holiday will play second. He made a fantastic play, kind of lunging to his right, making a jump throw to throw out Bo Bichette, turned a really nice double play in the game, starting at second base as well. He looks good, and his, his plate appearances were great on Tuesday. First at bat against Chris Bassett, one of the most underrated pitchers in baseball. One hopper to shortstop to Bo Bichette. It was hit pretty hard, but it looked like a routine play. But Bichette took his time, and Holiday beat it out at first base. Now, if they had review in spring training, Holiday was probably out by about an inch, but they don't. So he got an infield single, and he showed he's going to fight for every at-bat. Then he went up there, worked a 3-2 count, and walked against Chris Bassett, who does not walk a lot of hitters. And then finally, hit his second home run of the spring, and both of them, have been in Dunedin. The first one, remember, last weekend, the Grand Slam off of Yusei Kikuchi. This one was off of Chad Green, a right-hander who is trending towards making the Blue Jays' bullpen and has been a really good reliever in the past before all of his injuries. And a change-up, hanging, boom. Home run out to right center field, 97 miles per hour off the bat, the exit velocity, 376 feet for the holiday home run. The roster spot is there, the performance is there, the pedigree is there. You know, you hear Ben McDonald talking about it on the broadcast Tuesday, like, and some of it's because his dad was Matt Holiday and he was hanging around the clubhouses since he was a little kid, but he's not intimidated by the big leagues either, just for being a 20 year old. Put him on this team and let's go. It's, yeah, it's got to happen at this point. Second thing you need to do from Tuesday's game is that Cole Irvin struggled a little bit in this start while working on his command. Now, it was kind of rough to watch. 
early. Irvin actually did not finish the second inning, came out. Cade Stroud came in, and then Irvin went back in. He ended up throwing 75 pitches, which is his most of any spring training start. This was the fourth start of the spring for Irvin and you know gave up four runs, three hits, two strikeouts, but five walks in the three and two-thirds. Pretty concerning for Cole Irvin, especially a guy who's been such a command guy throughout his career with Oakland and when he was good with the Orioles in the second half last year. He gave up seven hard-hit balls. Now, he did talk after the game, and Andy Koska, I believe, of the Baltimore Banner was the first one to tweet this out there, that he talked after the game that he went into the start trying to work on hitting the corners, trying to work on the command, and he said he nibbled too much, and that's why he had five walks. And he also said that was why his velocity was down. Now, remember, when Irvin made his first start of spring, he threw a pitch at 96 miles per hour, which we had never seen, and he was sitting 94-95 with his sinker and his four-seam fastball, and we were like, this is not Cole Irvin. Cole Irvin averaged 91, 92 last year. And he talked about how he had done all the work at Tread Athletics to up his velocity and was feeling really good. Well, his velocity was kind of back down. It was sitting 92. He ran it up to 94 at times, but he was sitting 92, which is basically what his velo was last year with the Orioles. So it's not like it was down at all, but it was down from the 94 to 96 we were seeing throughout the spring. And Irvin did say that was a point of this outing. He was trying to mess with his velocity a little bit down and see if he could you know, get the command to where he wanted it to be. And it kind of all fell apart on him in this start. So yeah, what happened out there is a little concerning. It's nice to know that the velocity down was on purpose. And hopefully that 95, 96 is still in the bag for Cole Irvin. And again, his last two starts haven't been pristine. And he's going to have potentially one more this spring. We will see. I mean, the Orioles' last spring training game is Sunday, so he could start that one. If not, he'll probably throw a long bullpen like Monday or Tuesday and, and get himself ready to be the Orioles' number four or five starter. And that's the other thing for Cole Irvin. Like, yeah, hasn't been great, but with Bradish out, with Means out, with the changes he's made, Irvin has an opening day rotation spot, either fourth or fifth game, him or Wells. He's going to start one of those first five games. Now, the Orioles technically don't need a fifth starter for a couple of weeks but it seems like they're going to go that way. And Irvin's going to be on the team no matter what, whether it's for long reliever starter, he's out of options. The Orioles are going to want him there. But he's still going to be that number five starter. And uh, what I just worry about Irvin is that he doesn't get caught in between. If he's chasing the velocity, that's great. Most pitchers are going to be better at 96 than they are at 92. It's just how the game is played. So that's a good thing for Cole Irvin. But remember back in 2020 when John Means was really chasing velocity after that really good 2019 rookie season? And he got his fastball up to 95, 96, and the command just wasn't the same. And he was worse overall as a pitcher, except for the velocity. And Mean said, you know what? I could I could gain the velocity. I could do it, but it didn't help me as a pitcher. I was better with my command at 92, 93, and Means kind of took himself back there. There is a chance that that happens to Cole Irvin. He says, wow, I can get up to 94, 95, 96, but maybe my command isn't as good as I need it to be when I'm up there. So maybe he decides I'll settle back in at 92, and that's the better pitcher I can be because we saw him last year in the second half. We saw him for two years in Oakland. He could be a good starting pitcher with that velocity at 92. That doesn't hamper him at all. He's more of a command guy, soft contact guy, and eat a lot of innings. But the thing you don't want for Cole Irvin is for him to get caught up in the middle, somewhere in between getting the big velocity and knowing where he needs to be. If he's kind of teetering back and forth with, oh, I want the command, but I want the velocity and I can't have both and I'm switching back and forth, you don't want that. He needs to pick a lane. He has time to do so. And there's still time to figure out the command with the 95 mile per hour fastball. That's the Irvin you want in your rotation. So just something to watch here if he does pitch one more time this spring. But again, he's got a rotation spot. At this point, we'll see what happens when someone like John Means returns. Third thing you need to know from Tuesday, Colton Kowser destroyed a baseball. Destroyed a baseball. And Kowser had an amazing spring. I'm still projecting him to be that fourth outfielder and make the opening day roster, but it wasn't a great day for Kowser going in. He was 0 for 3 with three strikeouts to begin his day. Did not look good at all at the plate. Kind of looked lost, was missing pitches by a lot. And then he gets behind two strikes in, I believe, the sixth inning of this game against Brandon Isert, a left-hander who's not a big leaguer, but was a solid lefty out of the AAA bullpen for the Blue Jays last year and will probably be there this year and could get some major league time. So not a terrible pitcher, but not a legit big leaguer. Either way, it was a left-on-left -left home run for Colton Kowser, what he hit in that sixth inning. And my goodness, hardest hit ball today, 110.4 miles per hour off the bat. This thing traveled 463 feet to dead center field over the batter's eye in Dunedin for a solo homer for Colton Kowser. 
That was an absurd home run. This guy's making the team. Also, he started in center field in the game Tuesday, which is nice to see. The Orioles like that defensively. He continues to hit the ball well. He is making the team. Fourth thing you need to know, hey, other guys went deep too. Tyler Nevin and Connor Norby each had home runs in this game as well to go along with Holiday and Kowser. Norby got one off of Chris Bassett, which was nice to see. Norby's first homer of the spring. Got an inside fastball and just turned on that pitch. His hands are so quick. The questions about him are, you know, positionally, defensively, and, and where he's blocked in the infield. But just in terms of a pure hitter, I mean, he is one of the better ones in the Orioles system. It's been that way since he was at ECU, since the Orioles drafted him in the second round. Like, the hit tool, the power, it's awesome for Connor Norby. Like, that. there's no knock against that. It's just the situation he's in organizationally. But he turned on the inside fastball, got those hands inside the ball quickly, and just roped a ball down the left field line for a two-run homer. It was an impressive swing. And then Tyler Nevin, who is just, quite frankly, not making this team, but could be a nice depth piece and has had a really good spring. He homered as well. 380 feet, went three for four on the day. His solo homer tied the game also off of Isert. It's a nice day for the Orioles offense. Listen, when you score 13 runs, even if it's spring training, it's a nice day. And the fifth and final thing you need to know from Tuesday's game is that it was a nice day for Heston Kerstad. He continued with the rest of that offense. He swung it well, went three for four with three hard hit balls in this game. And I know he got off to a little bit of a slow start this spring. And with Kowser being so good, I think Kerstad is now more so on the outside looking in for one of those final opening day roster spots. But do not forget about Huston Kerstad and how hard he hits the ball and how elite he can be at the plate and how elite I think he will be in the major leagues this year for the Orioles. It's more of a circumstances thing that he may not now make the opening day roster like I had originally projected early in spring training. But that doesn't take anything away from Kerstad, who had a single at 104 off the bat, a single at 102, and a line out at 101 in this game. He was mashing the baseball and... When he's mashing the baseball, you just sit back and enjoy because it is fun to watch. So the Euros won the game. I want to give a couple of shout outs to just two minor leaguers who appeared late in this game for the Orioles. One was Alex Pham, who is a 19th round pick by the Orioles in 2021, right handed pitcher who was drafted as a reliever, but the Orioles last year turned him into a starter and a really good starter at that. Pham was super impressive. Now he was facing mostly minor league hitters late in this game against the Blue Jays, but the stuff looked really, really good for Alex Pham, and that's kind of how it looked for Pham all of last year. Pham last season got up to Bowie and had a 2.67 ERA in 61 innings in the Bay Sox rotation after just dominating in Aberdeen and getting that call up halfway through the season, but Pham goes two and two-thirds innings scoreless, three hits, four Ks, and one walk on 40 pitches just one hard hit ball against Alex Pham, who's not a very assuming, kind of a, a shorter right-hander, but who has really good stuff. We saw the fastball. It was 92 to 93 on the day. The cutter was really good. It's like a basically kind of a hard slider, 85 to 87. Got four whiffs on eight swings on that pitch. Showed a really good looking changeup. Guys swung at that twice and swung and missed. Big looping curveball that he kind of can drop in there for a strike at any time. It was a really good mix from Alex Pham. He's most likely going to start the year in the Bay Sox rotation. He doesn't factor in for the O's major leagues this year, but expect him if he pitches well to get to Norfolk this season. And we're talking about an impact potentially in 2025 because he's got some really, really good stuff. And then just wanted to shout out as well, Reed Trimble in this game. Trimble, who has had a tough go of it in the Orioles system. He was in 2021, that same draft as fam. The competitive balance B round pick by the Orioles. That's, that's a high draft pick. 65th overall in the 2021 draft. Really good looking left handed hitting outfielder out of the mid, a great college career. The injuries have just hurt him bad. Now he had a big double 103.2 off the bat late in this game for an RBI, but he's had a pretty bad shoulder injury he's been dealing with. And in three years in the O system, he's only had a total of 290 plate appearances, just hasn't been able to stay on the field. Well, it looks like he's finally healthy this spring, and hopefully he can get himself just. Just maybe start the year in double-A Bowie. Just get himself to Bowie, play in the high minors, show all the promise he showed for the Orioles to take him with that high of a draft pick back in 2021. And maybe if he stays healthy, you can add another Orioles minor league hitter to the list of guys who were just salivating over how good they can potentially be. But an offensive display for the Orioles on Tuesday, and we got to see it. We got the stats from it. That's what you want from a spring training game. But there's one other thing to take away. 
from that game, and that is that one Orioles player did leave the game. We'll talk about, although he's probably fine, the potential impact of Jordan Westberg being hit by that pitch coming up next. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by Prize Picks. Now, football season may be over, but basketball season and the action on the floor is heating up. Whether it's tournament season or the fight for playoff home court, there's no shortage of high stakes basketball moments this time of year. So get in on the excitement with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app, where you can turn your hoops knowledge into serious cash. You can earn up to 100 times your money on prize picks with as little as four correct picks. Turn 10 bucks into 1,000 with NBA, NHL, and college basketball entries today on prize picks. You just pick more or less on any stat line. So maybe you're looking at you know some games coming up, let's say in the tournament, and you're looking at Virginia and playing in the first four, and there's probably a stat line on Reese Beekman in terms of how many points he will score. You just take more or less it is that simple. So download the Prize Picks app today and use code Locked On MLB for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. Again, download the app, use code Locked On MLB for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars at Prize Picks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. So he is okay, but Jordan Westberg did leave the game. On Tuesday. And before we get to that, as you know, Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24 7 streaming channel, Locked On Sports Today. And baseball fans, mark your calendars for today, Wednesday, March 20th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, for the best MLB season preview coming exclusively to Locked On Sports Today. On Wednesday, March 20th, that's today at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, be the first to get local insight from the MLB local experts of the Locked On Podcast Network, including yours truly. So find it today, March 20th, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, on the Locked On Sports Today 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. So we're talking Jordan Westberg. Leaves this game in the fourth inning on Tuesday, hit by a 93-mile-per-hour fastball on the elbow. Now, he did have an elbow guard on, kind of the only piece of protective equipment that he wears. And he did stay in the game to run the bases, but then in the next half inning, he was starting this game at shortstop, came out of the game, and Errol Robinson replaced him. Shout out to Errol Robinson, who had the go-ahead two-run triple late in this game as well. It's been having a, a really fun spring. But Westberg comes out of the game. Now, luckily, Brandon Hyde said to reporters after the game that Westberg is fine, doesn't expect him to even be day-to-day or miss any time. He is all good, just totally precautionary to take him out of the game. But wanted to do something similar that I did a couple weeks ago when Cedric Mullins left that game with the hamstring issue. Now, Mullins did miss about a week of spring training games, but he is now back and looks to be good to go for opening day. But we were a little worried that maybe he wouldn't be. And I talked about what would the Orioles do without Mullins. So I wanted to look at what would the Orioles do without Westberg, or really more broadly, if they lost one of these infielders, who was kind of a a slam dunk definite to make the opening day roster right now, what would they do? And I think Westberg's a good guy to focus on because he would be an interesting case here. So he's going to be good. Again, he's going to be on this opening day roster. He's fine. But with him, here is my current, Opening day roster projection for hitters. Adley Rutschman and James McCann as my catchers. Seven infielders with Ryan Mountcastle, Ryan O'Hearn, Gunnar Henderson, Jordan Westberg, Ramon Arias, Jorge Mateo, and Jackson Holiday. And then the four outfielders are Austin Hayes, Cedric Mullins, Anthony Santander, and Colton Kowser. Now, if you take Westberg out of that equation, you could really add either an infielder or an outfielder. Because if you're putting Holiday on this roster, you're really carrying an extra infielder with seven of them. And you're only carrying four outfielders, knowing that Jorge Mateo has been working so much in the outfield this spring and over the offseason that the Orioles are prepared to put him at the outfield at any time and have him be kind of the super utility guy to give you an extra infielder. So if you did you lose Westberg for any amount of time, you could put in a fifth outfielder. You could replace him with a seventh infielder. And that puts a lot of guys in the mix. It puts the other outfielders, Heston Kerstad, Kyle Stowers, Ryan McKenna in the mix. It also puts a lot of the other infielders in the mix. Maybe it would be a Connor Norby. Maybe it would be a Kobe Mayo. Maybe even one of the veteran guys like a Nick Maton or a Colton Wong that the Orioles have brought in. They would all have a better chance of making this opening day roster with that open spot. But I think, and I've talked a lot about how Ryan McKenna, I just think his time is done. He's not going to make this roster. 
I think this kind of injury would be an opening for a guy like Ryan McKenna because you already have a lot of lefties. And I did an episode a couple of weeks ago to the Orioles have too many lefties slated to make this opening day roster. Now you take out Jordan Westberg, a right-handed hitter who mashes lefties. Are you going to throw in another lefty to replace him? Like, yeah, if you were just going with the next best player, it would make easy sense to decide that it's Heston Kirsten or even because of his spring, give that spot to Kyle Stowers but they are both left-handed hitters. Or if you just said, you know what, let's fill the void quickly with a veteran infielder that we have in the camp. So you went with Colton Wong or Nick Maton, both left-handed hitters. There's not a lot of righty options out there. So then you turn to Kobe Mayo. Okay, would Jordan Westberg lead to Kobe Mayo? Now, in this situation, we're saying Westberg misses a couple of weeks, right? I don't think the O's would go to Kobe Mayo in that sense and then just plan to send him back down When Westberg returns, they'd go for more of a quick fix guy who they're not looking to develop as much as a guy like Kobe Mayo. Now, it certainly wouldn't rule it out, and he's playing so well that maybe the Orioles are having a small consideration of putting Mayo on the opening day roster anyway, but that would definitely push it forward even more if Westberg was out. I really do think it it could be McKenna. You would want another right-handed bat, and with Westberg out, I mean, most of those ABs at second and third base that Westberg would vacate. Ramon Arias and Jackson Holiday would probably cover most of those defensive innings and those at-bats, but just with an infielder out, you would probably expect Jorge Mateo, who's also played a lot of second base this spring, to just play more infield, shortstop second, than you had previously thought because you wanted him in the outfield a lot. So most likely, you would maybe want another outfielder at that point with a right-handed bat and a guy you can expect to play well defensively play center field, be that right-handed hitting center field option that Mateo was going to be, maybe it would be McKenna. And maybe not, right? The Orioles could just say, you know what? We'll go with Colton Wong for two weeks. Or you know what? That gives us a chance to get Heston Kerstad on this roster where we didn't before. Or they could say, you know what? Kobe Mayo, let's do it. But that's kind of where we go here. Like there's still people worried and worried and worried. You know, does Ryan McKenna make this roster? I just think an injury is the only thing that's going to get him on this roster. There are so many guys playing so well, it's just not going to happen. And and maybe even Connor Norby would be the answer here if, if Jordan Westberg missed time. Like, he just hit a home run. He's a right-handed hitting infielder. He can play second base. But the whole thing here, and this is what I talked about when I talked about, you know, if Cedric Mullins misses time, this is what I continue to say when I'm breaking down who's going to make this roster. The Orioles just have a great problem. They have too many major league qualified hitters to make this team. And this is something I'm going to talk about next, but Brandon Hyde said earlier this week, they're going to go with 13 hitters and 13 pitchers. That's what we thought was going to happen. But there was always that possibility that the Orioles could carry 14 hitters and 12 pitchers to get an extra bat, a deserving bat in to this roster. And because there's so many off days early in the year, that the Orioles really don't need a fifth starter until like the third week of the season. So for like two and a half weeks, They could potentially get by with the one less pitcher and the one extra hitter, which could allow you to get a cursed out of Stowers, a Mayo, a someone like that on the opening day roster, a Connor Norby, could be anyone like that. But they want to have that extra pitcher, and I get it, right? When your pitching is weaker than your hitting, you want as many options in there as you could possibly have. It's just tough. It's a good problem to have. It's going to be great depth, right? Kobe Mayo and Connor Norby and Kyle Stowers and potentially Heston Kerstad and Ryan McKenna and... You know, maybe Nick Maton and Colton Wong, like all these guys could end up in AAA being fantastic depth for the Orioles. And yes, you know, we'd love to see them try and trade maybe a Norby, maybe an Arias, maybe a Stowers to go get, you know, big league ready relief help to help that bullpen right now. I'd be fine with that. But all this depth is good too. It is a good problem to have. And the point is, if Westberg were to go down, that would not be good. He's a slam dunk major leaguer for the Orioles this year and helps this team offensively and defensively a lot. But if he went down, I just named out like six options the Orioles could put on the opening day roster instead that would still make this team good and would be a good fit in their lineup and would contribute at the major league level. So here's the great thing going into the year. Yeah, the O's are going to make some really tough decisions on this roster in terms of the hitters. But if anyone gets injured, and it's going to happen, the O's have had some really good injury luck over the past two years. Somebody's going to go down. They're going to have so many options to replace them. And that is where this O's team could be put over the top because the depth is just above anyone else besides maybe like the Dodgers and the Rays have on their team and in their system right now. 
We got a couple more things to get to today before this episode is over. Just some news and notes, some things to throw in here from the Orioles over the past week. That is coming up next. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by Game Time. The best place, at least for me, to buy tickets because you shouldn't have to worry when you buy tickets to your next big event. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the events you want to go to, including Orioles games. Listen, we are eight days away from opening day. Get on Game Time and look for those tickets. They've got killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their best price guarantee. Game Time basically, they take the guesswork out of buying tickets. And you can literally buy tickets right on Utah Street, right outside the gates before the game. Tickets sent to your phone. You walk in. Game time just makes the user experience on their app so easy, easier than any other ticketing app. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On. That's L O C K E D O N for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets. Lowest price, guaranteed. So I wanted to get to just a few more Orioles news and notes before we wrap up today's Wednesday episode. And I wanted to start with some comments from Brandon Hyde throughout the week as he talked about Kyle Bradish earlier on Tuesday and said that Bradish still looks good and feels good after throwing that first bullpen last week. And something that Hyde slipped in there is he said the original reporting was Bradish threw 20 pitches. They were all fastballs his first time off a mound, and the elbow still felt good after the UCL sprain. However, Hyde just tossed in there that eh, Bradish may have slipped in a few breaking balls in that session. And, And why not? That's his number one most used pitch, that devastating Kyle Bradish slider. And it's good to know that he did that, and he was still feeling good, and he's still feeling good at this point. And hopefully soon there is another bullpen coming for Kyle Bradish. We know John Means from his appearance on Foul Territory, the show that was live from Orioles camp on Tuesday. We know he threw a second live BP, I believe he said Monday or Tuesday of this week. And they asked him when he expect to be back. And he said, hopefully late April. I've been targeting, you know, kind of May 1st for John Means. So hopefully late April, he can rejoin this Orioles rotation. Oh, sent another player down to minor league camp. It was Bruce Zimmerman that they did on Tuesday. Bruce still on the 40-man roster, still a part of the depth of this team, but just, you know, with with the other options they brought in, like Julio Tehran and and Albert Suarez to potentially be a long man to make the team, it just seemed like Zimmerman wasn't going to make it. He will start the year most likely in the AAA Norfolk rotation. And uh, there's now 46 players in big league camp. You still got to get it down to 26 in the next eight days. So still a lot of work for the Orioles to do. And as I mentioned, Hyde saying, They will go 13 hitters and 13 pitchers to begin the season. No update on Austin Hayes, who was a little under the weather and has missed a couple of games. We did get an update on Ryan Mountcastle, though. He has not played in over a week, has not appeared since last Tuesday, March 12th, in a spring training game. Orioles said it was because of neck stiffness, but Mountcastle said, as reported by Rock Tobacco and others, that he took live BP on Tuesday and expects to be in today's game. The Wednesday evening game at Ed Smith Stadium, Mountcastle expects to return to the lineup. That tells me Ryan Mountcastle should be good for opening day for the Orioles. And then finally, we got some positive Masson news over the past week with the story breaking that Masson struck a deal with Fubo TV. Now, I know of Fubo TV. I don't personally know anyone who subscribes to that service, but it's kind of a similar thing like DirecTV Stream or like YouTube TV that's actually a little more sports geared, I believe. Fubo TV has a deal now with Masson where if you have Fubo TV as kind of your cord cutter, you no longer have cable, you subscribe to this instead, you can get Masson. So they joined DirecTV Stream as those kind of only two cable alternatives that have Masson. We know the big issue is YouTube TV, which seems to be the most popular of these, does not have Masson. I don't believe Hulu with live sports has Masson either to this point. And of course, the biggest issue has been Masson and Xfinity. Now, they did finally strike a deal to keep Masson on Xfinity, which is the biggest cable provider in this Baltimore area. But they moved Masson up to a higher cable package. So it's now $20 more per month for Xfinity customers if they want to keep Masson at this point. It's just, it's not good. We need a direct-to-consumer product. Hopefully that's coming soon. But... If you are a cord cutter and you're looking for more options, this at the very least means you get more options. And I know Fubo has a lot of sports options as well. So if you're just a big sports fan, Masson now included with Fubo TV. So, hey, at least you got the option 
there. But that'll do it for today's episode. We will be back tomorrow. We got another televised Orioles spring training game on Wednesday evening at Ed Smith Stadium. We'll break that one down and get you all the Orioles news and notes you need as we get closer and closer to opening day. That's coming up on tomorrow's episode. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.